uh, uh, Professor. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I have a question about homework. Yeah. Uh, so I'm almost done with the coding, but uh, I'm just wondering if I can say uh, output the say the array to a file and uh, uh, try to plot use uh, using another software. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Like a handy package in C plus plus for plotting. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Already, let's um, let's get started. Um, so, just a reminder: uh, the first homework is due tomorrow, and um, there are office hours uh, tonight and tomorrow morning and tonight. And again, if there are questions, you're also welcome to ask questions here during the lecture. Um, we have a very small class today. We only have I see only two students in here. Um, that's fine if. Um, if there are questions from from uh, either one, uh, by all means ask them. Otherwise, we're going to get started on the lecture. So last time we were uh, working on characteristic functions. And so this is uh, today's big goal. So. So today's goal, uh, today's goals uh, so is to, uh, to find a way to recover, uh, this is the inversion, uh, invert, um, the distribution The distribution. Um, so recall that the distribution is uh, f of x the distribution is f of x um, from uh, the characteristic function character is characteristic function Right, and the characteristic function is uh, this E expectation of I T X. Like in other words, so in other words, give a formula for F in terms of uh, the um, characteristic function. Uh, 
And then we're gonna look at some applications. We're gonna look at some applications, for example, um, uh, we're gonna be looking at, uh, we can use this relationship between the distribution and the characteristic function. It will allow us to perform certain computations. It can be a computational tool. And, um, and of course, for us, uh, it's about stochastic volatility models. And I don't think we're gonna get down to here uh, this time, but next time we'll talk about Histon and uh, Stein and Stein. So in terms of homework, uh, there are quite a bit of this part over here. There's a lot of that in homework too. And the applications here in terms of stochastic volatility models, this will be in, uh, in homework three. So that's what I had in mind for, um, for today. Uh, we talked a bit about characteristic functions last time. Um, I'm gonna f I'm gonna start I'm gonna start by recalling if um, something about this uh, integral that um, that we were we were discussing last time. So <laughs> it happens in this uh, inversion formula. It it happens that um, there's an integral that appears, and we're gonna see that in the proof. Um, so we we will encounter. Um, and this is the improper uh, Riemann integral. And this is integral from zero to infinity of sine x over x uh, dx. And um, So here it says improper, and, and so the, the key thing is that, well, not one key thing, one key thing is that this object here is not integral. The function, the problem is that um, uh, this function uh, that maps x into sine x over x, this is not integral. So if you look at, maybe I can show you a picture on Mathematica and we can have a look there. Um, uh, just get a new file for Mathematica. So the function we're interested in is this, um, say g of x is equal to sine x divided by x. And if we look at its picture, looking at it from say zero to 10, that's the picture we're looking at. <clears throat> and so of course, sine x is bounded by one. So as x goes to infinity, sine x over x, it does go to zero. But the problem happens that when I integrate an absolute value, it becomes plus infinity. So actually, I don't know what happens if you ask if you ask um, Mathematica to integrate the absolute value. Doesn't like doing that. Um, So let's do it on a piece of paper. Um, what you can see if I integrate, if I instead just integrate uh, g of x without the absolute value, you get this pi over two. And so let me show you that when you integrate the absolute value, we talked a bit about that last time, but let me just show you on a piece of paper why this is not integrable. So, so what does it mean to be not integral? So if I look at the 
but look at the integral from zero to infinity of the absolute value of sine x over x dx, I get plus infinity. So that, <coughs> that's what it means to be uh, not integrable. And um, we looked at the picture of sine x over x, it has these bubbles. If I, if I wanted, I could write this integral so sine x, sine x, it goes from, uh, it's one at zero and then it dips down. And then over here it is minus one at um, no v pi. And then it comes back up to zero at, so here we have two pi. And so on. So if I integrate, if I integrate from, uh, so when I take the absolute value, this is this here is my sine x. If I take the absolute value, I'll have the bubbles switch around. Right. So if, it, if I look at uh, the integral from zero to infinity, I'll be able to break that up. So this will be pi over two. Uh, this would be three pi over two, right? So every pi interval, I will get, I'll get the same value. So I can, I can break the integral up of sine x over x. I can write this here as a sum and then say from um, uh, k equals, uh, so here we have k pi over two, k plus one, pi over two. So from k equal to zero to infinity of sine x over x, absolute value dx. And if I wanted to bound it from below, I could divide by the upper bound here Right, so now on these intervals, the integral of sine x is always the same. So I'll get here a constant, some coefficient, and then I'll have a sum from k equals zero to infinity. And then I'll have this integral from k pi over two to k plus one pi over two. And if I, if I wanna make it smaller, instead of x here, I can put in the upper bound. So that will be one divided by k plus one pi over two dx. So this is just equal to another constant. And then I'll have a sum here, one over uh, k plus one from zero to infinity. And when I sum this, it becomes plus infinity. So the, <clears throat> this function that we're gonna be dealing with, it, um, it's not integrable. So when I take absolute value, I integrate it, it blows up to plus infinity. And um, unfortunately, when, as, as we start working, we will to go from the characteristic function back to the uh, distribution, this integral, that there'll be an integral that's that's going to do that. And that integral um, uh, is only given as this improper Riemann integral. That is that this, this thing here, this thing here is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of sine x over x integral from zero to n. There are lots of these integrals that, that behave like that. For example, you can take the x away downstairs and you'll have the same phenomenon. There are lots of functions. There are lots, there are lots of functions. Uh, uh, are not uh, integrable, but, uh, but have a finite, um, but have a finite improper integral. 
we could just take sine x. If I look at the integral from, uh, uh, should we say cosine, maybe we say cosine, cosine x dx, I'm looking at it from minus n to n, I take the limit, this will be zero, but uh, if I integrate over r of the absolute value of cosine, this is equal to plus infinity. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Let me see what, what's there. Why do you draw a cosine? Did I draw the wrong function here? Oh, yeah, so this here is sine x uh, over x. Well, let's go back and have a look at the picture. Uh, right, this this was the this is the function I'm trying to depict here. I'm trying to depict. I'm trying to depict this um, this function here. Right. So what I'm saying is, when I take absolute value, we can do that too. We can plot this one. Can plot the absolute value, and then I'm I'm getting these bumps here, and these bumps are smaller and smaller and smaller. So even though these bumps are smaller and smaller and smaller, I can put this box in here that has like a size one over K. And um, you know, maybe my indices are a little bit off here. Maybe it just looks like pi and then uh, two pi's. Yeah, maybe, my, maybe my indices are off here. So that constant might have to be changed a little bit what I wrote here, but it doesn't matter. So inside here, I can put I can put uh, one over K in each one of them. And so when I sum up one over K, if I sum, if I sum uh, one divided by what's K plus one, I'm summing that from zero to infinity. Uh, it doesn't converge, right? So it becomes plus infinity. So it's not integral also, and, and Mathematica says like it's pi over two. And this coefficient pi over two, this is, this is an important coefficient because it appears in this uh, inversion formula that we're gonna derive. So I wanna spend a little bit of time, I wanna spend a little bit of time trying to compute um, what this integral here is. So let me try to do that. So, so we claim, we claim that, um, that the limit uh, from zero to say a of sine uh, x over x uh, dx uh, a to infinity that this is equal to pi over two. And our F, our inversion formula, our inversion formula is going to have this pi over two in it. So let me spend a little bit of time trying to argue why uh, why we see this uh, why we see this coefficient. And the, the coefficient is coming from, let's just recall uh, a uh, standard trick uh, in calculus. Uh, this is the arc 10 uh, substitution. Um, if I'm looking at an integral uh, say I'm looking at an integral from uh, a to b of one over one plus, and then this x squared here, and then dx. When you face an integral like this, uh, arc tan is a um, is what comes to mind. Uh, so you substitute in. So here you substitute in uh, x is equal to say tangent of theta.
right? And then you get that dx d theta, and this is going to be uh, the derivative of uh, sine theta over, is it cosine theta? And um, when you do the substitution here, uh, so computer derivative, uh, so that's going to give you the new decopian, and then you're going to do x squared, right? So that's going to be sine over. Uh, so you'll write this here as an integral of one over. Uh, one plus, and then it's going to be sine theta divided by cosine theta uh, squared times, and then so here you need that derivative d of sine theta over cosine theta. Uh, so you need this derivative, write it better. Write it as this. So there's a derivative there derivative there, and then you have your d theta. And then over here, instead of having x be a, you will have, uh, you'll have x be, uh, so x is a here, so you're gonna have that theta is equal to tan minus one of a, and you'll have tan uh, minus one of b up here. And the miraculous thing is that all this stuff in here becomes one. And this here becomes one. And this comes from the rule we had last time that says that when I take cosine theta squared, and you can see the squares popping up everywhere, plus sine theta, I get a one. So this dramatically simplifies <laughs> quite a bit uh, to these differences. So this becomes um, uh, 10 uh, minus one of B minus 10 uh, minus one of A. And so you just need to take the limits now as a and b goes to infinity and you're going to end up with this uh, that pi is going to pop out here so these uh, when, when you do integrals of, of this sort here uh, when you ever see this one over uh, x squared so for us what we're going to be using is uh, we will have, uh, so for us, we'll use, we'll use this here for um, uh, B is plus infinity and A is zero. So when we plug it in here, we're gonna get this pi over two. This will give us that the integral from zero to infinity of one over one plus X squared. This is uh, pi over two. So we have the integral one over one plus x squared. We can calculate it using this uh, arctan substitution that I'm sure uh, everybody has seen before in, uh, in calculus. So that's pi over two and, and this is you can see this is, if nothing else, it's uh, reclaiming that um, that this integral you're interested in is exactly equal to the value of that integral that uh, that comes out uh, that we can calculate by means of um, the arctan substitution. So we have to combine these two things and figure out how how to do that. Uh, the um, The trick is, so there's a trick to calculate this. Let me show you how to do it. So the, um, there is a, um, the trick uh, to calculate, to calculate this, uh, this limit. Uh, is to use uh, Fubini. So Fubini's theorem, that's the one that allows you to uh, switch, 
switch the uh, switch the order in a double integral. Okay. So what's what's the idea? Well, we look at the function. If we look at e to the minus y x sine x. If I look at this function here, and I integrate with respect to y, right? So, in my original function, there's no y. So I'm, I'm looking at a new function here that has a y in it, and I'm integrating here from zero to infinity in the y variable. I can perform that integral. Like first of all, there's no there's no y dependence on the sign, so that sign can go outside. <clears throat> and so here I'll have the derivative, I need to integrate respect to the y variable. Um, I'll get minus and then have to divide by here by x. Uh, and then um, and then I'll have to plot in, uh, I'll have to plug in, what will I have to plug in? So x is positive, we're integrating here from zero to infinity, so x is positive. Uh, when I plug in, when I plug in y equal to infinity, I'm gonna get uh, zero minus, when I plug in a zero, I'm gonna get a one. So this here ends up being exactly sine x over x. So there's a trick to calculate this integral and it is to write this sine x over x exactly as this integral here. So this will allow me to write the integral from zero to a sine x over x and dx. I can, instead of writing that, I can write it as an integral from zero to a, zero to infinity, e to the minus y x sine x and dy and dx. And so this, this is the place where we use Fubini. This is the place where we use Fubini. Uh, we use the Fubini, so we switch these two. Right, the, the inner one, this here is the y variable. And the outer one, this is my x variable. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna switch them. I'll move x over here. I'll move x over here, so now that's going to run from 0 to a. And I'll move the y outside, so this is going to run from 0 to infinity. Same function, e to the minus x, y, sine, and then you have dx and dy. Okay. So the miraculous thing is that I'm now, I'm now facing I'm now facing uh, an integral that seemingly looks even, I mean, now we both have, there's an X here and um, I, I got rid of the X downstairs, right? And I traded it out with an exponential function. So can I calculate, can I calculate the inner guy here with respect to X? And so it's possible to calculate, it's possible uh, to calculate the inner integral because um, see if I got this right. Uh, if I look at the derivative with respect to x of a specific function, uh, let me write out what the function is. It's e y divided by y squared plus one times y sine x minus cosine. If I take the derivative with respect to x of this particular monstrosity of a function, this miracle happens and I'm gonna get this function up there, e y x sine x. So I can find a function that has uh, it has this integrand as its derivative, well, up to a minus sign. So to use this formula, I need to put a minus y in, 
everywhere, but other than that, so I can put a minus y here and then put a minus y there and put a minus y over there. So if I do that, then, uh, then I can evaluate this inner integral here simply by evaluating this, this function uh, that I have on the, on the left-hand side. At x equal to the two endpoints. So what we get is, so this integral from zero to a of sine x over x dx, this becomes um, this becomes an integral from zero to a, and then we need to evaluate. We need to evaluate this one here at the upper limit. So be a minus uh, a y sine a. Uh, I'll put them. I'll split them up. So I'll also have a, uh, a e to the minus y a divided by y squared plus one. That would be one part. So be a minus uh, cosine of a e to the minus y a divided by y squared plus one. And then uh, I have to subtract when I put the lower part in here. This is when x is equal to zero. x is equal to zero, this one here drops, the minus signs drop, I get cosine of zero, this is a one, I'm gonna get uh, plus uh, one over one plus y squared. Yeah. <clears throat> and I know when I, when I pass, when I integrate the last one, that was what we just talked about, one over y squared, when I integrate that from zero to infinity, I, um, I get pi over two. This here implies that if I look at the absolute value of the integral from zero to a of sine x over x, um, just put infinity here, minus minus, and then this one here was pi over two. This is gonna be bounded by, like sine a, this is bounded by one in absolute value. So I'm gonna get an integral from zero to infinity. And then what will I have? This one here, if I just put a one instead, I'm gonna get something that's even bigger because y squared is positive. So I'll have y e to the minus y a dy, that will be for the first one. Then there'll be an integral from zero to infinity minus cosine a. Again, I can put a one, that'll make it bigger. I can drop the y squared down here, that'll make it even bigger because it's one plus. And then I'll have e to the minus y a with dy. And these integral, these are integrals that we can, um, these are integrals that we can compute. Maybe I do want to have a over here on the left hand side. I do want to have A here on the left hand side. On the, on the right hand side, I'll get, uh, I'll get something with one over A here and something with one over A squared here. And this thing goes to zero as A goes to plus infinity. Something along these lines will, will show you that, that these two indeed converge to each other. 
So we know theoretically that the tick to calculator to show that this is equal to pi over two uh, goes through this, this calculation, but we were talking about in the beginning like we're going to be doing we're going to be doing um, we're going to be doing uh, applications of this into stochastic volatility models. So why is it important that you have this sort of um, distinction between being integrable and then just being this improper Riemann integral? So I I wrote up a little piece of code trying to illustrate that um, that this year is uh, this is this is tricky, and um, let me try to pull that code out. So the code here on the left-hand side <coughs> serves to illustrate this problem that we're dealing with. Um, so the correct value is this pi over two. And so what I did was, uh, what I did was I took, so the function f here, this is just my sine x over x. So uh, the first one here just does a basic Taylor approximation. So I'm gridding out, I'm gridding out the uh, axis, uh, the positive axis in terms of uh, uh, like increments of 0 0.1. Um, and then I'm cutting it off at a higher and higher level. So here I'm looking at 10th to the i, the i is running to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And then I'm just doing a basic Taylor sum approximation I'm taking the time step and then I'm looking at these rectangles and I'm adding them up. So let's see how that goes. And um, this is my little code here. Uh, so the correct value is 1.5702, this is pi over two. And then let's look at how, <clears throat> when I'm varying the, uh, the maximal X value, how does the Taylor approximation do? And it looks like it's doing pretty well. Um, you go down, so here we're down to 100,000, I get 1.5208. Uh, my computer can go up to seven, then I, then there is, uh, my computer can't run any further. Um, I get this 1.5208. Okay, so this is not, not too shabby. This is, uh, this is up to the first four digits. It's exactly the same. Okay, so then, so that's great. So the Taylor approximation works, but as you can see here, uh, my laptop is limited to how many uh, how many x's I can do. If I instead use one of the built-in tools that um, a Mathematica offer and most other numerical packages offer, is this uh, quadrature quadrature integration. Um, <clears throat> so. There's a numerical method that allows you to compute these, uh, these integrals and it's called this uh, QUAD and the G that's sitting right here, this is Gauss. Uh, I forget what the K is, but this is Gauss. This thing here, that's a numerical method that the software has built in. Um, so it's much faster uh, than, uh, than what we just did with the Taylor. And if you run that thing, I see what happens. You can see you get warning signs everywhere now. Um, we start out here with the correct value and um, you run, you run it and you can see it does pretty well for smaller cutoffs. It goes up to like the correct value is this 5708 and it looks like it's, it's within the range. But then when you move further and further out into the tail like, so you do higher and higher cutoffs, you see this starts oscillating like crazy. Now you get negative values and you get 5.97. And uh, warnings come up and it says that this thing is, this is not stable, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, and, and this package here, this uh, QU uh, ADGK, there are lots of these uh, quadrature um, packages around. So. If you want to know more about them, 
just um, if you don't know more about them, then just um, Google it. Google them. Uh, the uh, numerical evaluating of an integral. So here, this is this Gauss quadrature, uh, uh, um, and this is a method that the um, the software has uh, has built into it that will allow you to uh, uh, to compute these um, uh, these integrals. But what I'm trying to get get across here is that you should be a little bit skeptical about that because uh, if you just use a package uh, to perform these uh, numerical integrals, it um, it can oscillate like crazy. And okay, so then of course you can go back and do tail approximation because the definition of this improper integral is exactly as a limit. Uh, but then you run into the problem that uh, you're severely limited by um, uh, the time that it takes and the memory that you need to do it. So it presents a real challenge uh, to work with these formulas here in, uh, in practice. Okay, are there any questions about, about, these, uh, about this particular integral of sine x over x? I think the built-in uh, function should be working well if the function is uh, Riemann integrable, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 So for yeah. So good point. So um, if I change if I change it here, the problem is that the function sine x over x doesn't die off fast enough, right? So if I change this thing here to x squared, and I think I need to do this. Um, so now it's dying off faster. And uh, and now we should have no problem. It sure seems like it is. Uh, let me pick another function here. Um, so, so now. As soon as you're integrable, uh, these uh, built-in functions they behave much better. Uh, the, the only point I, I want to make is when you have these functions that are not integrable, but are uh, are such that the improper integral is well defined, and if you just blindly use a uh, a numerical package, then you can run into trouble. So and, and sine x over x is, is like the prototype of these functions that are uh, that, that have a nice improper integral, but they are not integral. And and it's exactly that function that appears in this formula that we need. And, uh, and so this is why we're spending some time on it. So just look out when you do homework number three. Just look out when you. Um, uh, these integrals that you have to implement, so you cannot implement the exact integral, you have to implement an approximation of it. Just look out because um, if you use a package, you need to make sure that it's a package that can deal with these improper integrals um, without the function being integral. Are there other questions, comments? So we are getting closer to this inversion theorem. Um, there was, there is a step in that inversion theorem that relies on using the um, the monotone and um, it relies on using the dominated convergence theorem. So let me just briefly recall what that is. Uh, I know for those of you that, I know some of you, uh, 
at least the ones of you that were in my uh, 621 class. In there, we talked about uh, a little bit about the monotone and dominating convergence theorem, but I know that not all of you were in there. So let me just, um, let, me, let me cover it one more time. So just uh, so just uh, recall uh, the monotone as well as dominating uh, convergence theorems. Uh, right, so you take uh, so either either x n uh, those are your random variables. The monotone either xn is less than xn plus one or or you can find a variable y such that uh, absolute value of xn is less than y so this is the first one and then the second one is i'm going to take the absolute value right so y here is going to be positive so there exists a random variable that goes from omega such that the absolute value of the y's, we have a sequence. So either the sequence uh, of random variables you satisfy, either the sequence of random variables satisfies uh, that it's monotone or it satisfies that you can dominate it with an integrable random variable. So either let the sequence, uh, either let the sequence random variable satisfy uh, that is monotone or let it satisfy that you can find this random variable that does not depend upon N such that these two properties hold. Well then, if I compute the limit, um, and then, in the, then you compute the limit as the expectation of uh, expect you compute the limit of the expectations. That's going to be equal to the uh, expectation of the limit. So here that limit is guaranteed to exist. And so here you also need to know that the limit exists. What it says is that you can exchange expectation and the limit operator. And there are two, there are two sets of conditions that will allow you to do it. Either you have monotonicity here you typically have positivity. So you have monotonicity or you have this uh, random variable that is dominating. Right, so this one here, this is gonna be the one that we'll use. This is, uh, this is for us uh, to use uh, today. And uh, let me give you one example. Let me give you one example of how one could use, um, how one could use, uh, the dominated uh, convergence theorem in, con uh, in, in the context of a characteristic function. So I'll, <clears throat> if we let them, um, let's do a lemma. So, we've, so we're gonna let F uh, be a density function. Let F be a density function. So what does that mean? So if it's positive and you integrate it, you get one. And then we look at the, um, the characteristic function corresponding to uh, the distribution that has F as its density. So let's call that characteristic function for phi of t. So then we have a density function, then the characteristic function, uh, which is gonna be the expectation as before E t of x and now x has that density function little f this will be an integral of e i t x and then uh, f of x dx 
and you integrate uh, over say r. Then this function here is bounded by one. We saw that last time because the absolute value of the integrand here is bounded by one and phi is continuous. So that's the new part. So if you take, if you have a density function, then you're gonna get, so we'll, we'll be working with the assumption that the random variables we have, we have these density functions. Then the characteristic function, we will see now that, well, it's bounded, we saw that last time, but we'll see now that it's continuous. And to prove continuity, this is where we'll use dominated convergence. You could also have here, you could have here, this is a sequence of random variables that will satisfy this. You could also have a function, a sequence of functions. These could be functions. Uh, so they could be, uh, could be that the functions are monotone or uh, there could exist this, uh, this Y, so let me call that a G that is positive, so it goes from R uh, uh, such that, well, I need the limit of Fn of X, I need this to exist. I need uh, the boundedness, so I need the absolute value of Fn to be bounded by G. And then I need G to be integrable. So on the left-hand side, I'm working with random variables. On the right-hand side in red, this is where I have the same statement, uh, but for functions instead of, uh, instead of random variables. So here, the, these functions, their domain will be R. Over here, these random variables, their domain will be omega. So there are versions of the monotone dominated uh, convergence theorems for both cases. And we're gonna be using the one here in red to prove the theorem down here. How would one go about proving the lemma? Right, so T here, T here is a real number. So I need to prove continuity as a function varying over the real number. So what I'll do is I'll let, let H uh, be a small number. And then what I want to do is I want to look at the difference between phi of t plus h and phi. And I can write that out by using the definition of phi. That's the characteristic function. So this will be the absolute value. This will be the absolute value of two integrals. E, i, t, x. And then instead of t here, I need to have I need to have t plus h times uh, x. Uh, f of x dx minus, and then the integral over r e i t x f of x dx. So you get these two, you can combine them, right? It's the same function, both places. You can combine them as an integral over R. And there's a common factor, E, I, T, uh, X times, I will have here E, I, H, X, and minus one, and then f of x dx. And so what I'm interested in is showing that as h goes to zero, this difference here is, um,
what I'm interested in is as a function of h, when h goes to zero, I want to make this difference here uh, vanish. And so the first thing I can do is I can use, uh, I can move the absolute value inside. And this will give me the integral over r, absolute value of eitx, absolute value of eihx minus one, f of x was positive, no absolute value. I know the length of this thing here, this is equal to one. Right, so all in all, I get that this is the integral of the absolute value of e i h x minus one f of x. And I wanna see what happens here. I wanna see what happens here as h goes to zero. So we know if I take the limit as h uh, goes to zero of e i h x, I'm gonna get exactly one. So if, if I could move the limit inside here, we will be done. So I'm looking at the limit as h goes to zero of that difference phi t plus h minus phi t. This will be less than the limit h going to zero of what I have here. And the question is, can I pull this limit here inside? Because if I can, what I'm gonna get here is a zero. So we wanna use dominated convergence. So to do this, to move, to move the limit, to move the limit, uh, inside, to move the limit inside the integral, I need to use, you'll use dominated convergence and we need to find that G. So what I need is, I need a G function. So we need a G such that when I take absolute value, so I have E I H X, minus one times f of x. I need this to be bounded by uh, g of x for any h. And I need the integral of g of x over r to be finite. So what should we choose? What should we choose for g of x? Any ideas? need something here. This is the inequality we're going to be looking at. What should we choose for G? What kind of a G would satisfy this?
Any guesses, guys? How bad can this uh, absolute value of EIH, how bad can it be? Should probably be something here with f of x. But what else should it be? Would f of x work? Is f of x, is this always bounded by one? Well, let's see, e i h, e i h x. How bad can this one here be? Can it be, it's gonna be bad when it's negative. So can I make this, how, how negative can I make this? Well, I could make it to be negative minus one. This one here in absolute value is always bounded by one. So the worst of this here can be is two. Okay, so I can use, I can use two F and that is integrable because F integrates to one. And this is of course finite. So then I can use dominated convergence to pull this inside, swap the limits. Okay, that this is equal to an integral of zero times f of x dx, and this is equal to zero, of course. And so here is where we use, this here is dominated convergence. Key there was you have a <clears throat> you have these functions that vary the, with that parameter that you're passing uh, in this case to zero, and um, you need to find some function that doesn't depend upon that parameter but is is integrable. So this thing here has to be finite, right? And g is positive, and g is positive because f is a density function. So this is one application of the dominated convergence theorem. It shows that uh, characteristic functions, they are continuous. Okay. Are there any questions on this argument here? Not, I think we're finally ready to um, to get into uh, the um, the inversion theorem. So that's what's coming now. The um, so the theorem. This is the inversion theorem. We're going to state it under the assumption that um, f is a dense uh, the distribution. So we're going to say that let f, right, that's my distribution function. Let this guy have a density. And I'm denoting the density by f. Then I can recover, then I can recover. Uh, f here from its characteristic function. Then uh, f of x <coughs> can be recovered. And here's the formula. So this is minus, so the one half minus one over pi. So you see this pi is coming up, integral from zero to infinity. And then there's the imaginary component of e minus i t x phi of t divided by t dt and this here is for x in r so here we have the characteristic function characteristic function is a complex number you can get the distribution function back from the characteristic function where, where phi is the characteristic function, phi of t is the uh, 
well, you can write it as the expectation of i, t, and then the random variable x. If you want, you can write it out in terms of its distribution. You can write this here as an integral over r of d i t x. And then here you have the distribution. But we also worked on the assumption that you had a density little f. So if you want that, you'll get e i t x uh, f of x dx. So the thing to note is that here you have e i t x. And up here you have minus basically what you had down here. So going from the density or from the distribution more generally to the characteristic function, there's a plus. When you invert and go backward, you put in a minus sign. You will see uh, there's a traditional formula Uh, the traditional formula, this is a corollary. This is the, uh, you, you often see this formula. You often see this formula if you start Googling. Um, corollary, it says that if if phi here is integrable, right, so that means that you can take an integral over r of the absolute value of 5t and you're finite. If phi is integrable, there is a very nice formula that will give you the density in terms of phi. Well, in that case, you can recover uh, the density f of x by one over two pi integral over r. And then we need a minus sign up there, e to the minus i t x, uh, five t dt. So if you just compare the two bottom bottom lines, right? So you go from you go from the density to the characteristic function by integrating this i exponential of i t x. And if you want to go backwards, it's basically the same formula. The only difference is that this is minus sign here, and there's a minus sign here, and then there's a scalar. There's one over two pi. There's another one over two pi here. Hang on one one minute, my kids. I may be ignoring all this here. Hey, 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 Becky, this is an off time there. Okay. So these, <clears throat> the first formula, this is the, this is the general one. And then the, the second one, if, if phi here happens to be integral, you can get something uh, that is more specific, but just some things to note. <coughs> just some notes, if I call this general formula here for uh, for star, the, the note for star is that uh, this is this is an uh, improper uh, Riemann integral. Right, so this thing here is defined as a limit. I should also say that uh, the second formula. So this is that's one thing to note. Um, it's an improper integral, and and the second one is uh, the second one to note is that the corollary 
uh, does not hold. Uh, so it does not hold uh, if um, does not hold in general. Recall it does not hold. Uh, so I should say here in general. If phi is uh, not integral. Um, and um, and this one here is in your homework too. And let me just show you what I had in mind for for this homework too. Here. Let me share this and then uh, let's talk about that that homework. Um, but this here is your next uh, your next homework. Um, so it's this it's this question here. Uh, <clears throat> you see here there is a function. Here there is a function f, which is um, it's just the um, uh, this is the density for the uniform on the interval zero to one, right? So that's equal to one on that interval. Uh, zero to one, and then is equal to zero everywhere else. Right, so this is the uniform density, and the uniform density is discontinuous, right? Because it's not continuous at zero, and it's not continuous at one. Right to the left of zero, it's zero, and to the right of of zero is equal to the one, and the same thing at the point x equal to one, it has the same problem. So little f here is discontinuous. So little f here is discontinuous, and um, and if you look at that <coughs> corollary, we just proven that objects like these ones here, they are continuous. Right, so this formula, so that means that if you have this violation, uh, if this thing here, if, if that holds, well, then you're going to be continuous. So. As a function of x, this object here is continuous. This is what we just proven, and and this won't work here if I put if I put a discontinuous function on the left hand side, right, and the right hand side is continuous. You're going to have a problem. Uh, so this has to do with whether or not this thing up here is integrable. So if so let me just expand on this. If the integral phi of t um, Is finite. Well, then, uh, then the map that maps x, x here is somewhere in R. One over two pi integral over R e to the minus i t x phi. And this is continuous. Just proved that. That was on page page six and seven. And so, so, for example, so if so for for f of x uh, being one when x belongs to the interval zero and one and zero else. Right, so the picture is here you look at the interval from zero to one. And it is zero here and zero here. Right, this is my f of x. This one here is discontinuous. At the two points zero and one. All right, so imagine so if and, and it's a density function, of course, because this is the uniform density. This is the uniform density that is discontinuous. So can we have 
So can uh, can phi of t if we integrate uh, over r of e i t x uh, f of x dx can this one be integrable? And the answer is no, no, because that would imply, and this is by the corollary, uh, that uh, f of x would be that inversion formula one over two pi integral uh, over r, and then you run it backwards, so you need the minus i t x, phi of t dt, which in turn implies that f is continuous. And so that's not possible. And this is what that problem in the homework, what that problem in the homework is about. So <clears throat> this assumption that's typically given, uh, that's this assumption that is that is typically given um, for this result down here to be true, if it's um, if something like this is to be true, then uh, the left-hand side uh, is going to be continuous, and there are lots of lots of density functions that are not continuous. And, um, and that means that this condition up here is violated. And so just look out, look out for that. Um, this call over here, it is it is useful, but you always have to check this condition that the characteristic function has this integrability property because without it, uh, you're not going to get something like this. And indeed, a very simple example is just a uniform. Uh, the uniform distribution is going to violate it. What we'll be doing, what we'll be doing, is um, improving this inversion theorem here, and um, and looking at. So, I think this might be a good time to take a a, a little break. We're improving this inversion theorem, and then um, uh, and then we're looking. We'll be looking at uh, at an application of it. Um, and that application we'll be looking at, we are actually in this case where you have an integrable phi. So, so now we've seen an example where phi is not integrable, and um, and then you'll see an example uh, where it is integrable. Okay, let's take a little break here. If there are no questions, are there any questions before we take a a ten minute break? Okay, then I'll see you in about 10 minutes on a different Zoom link.